is a special time uh, of the year for us at Living Waters because last November we uh, had ended up our small groups and uh, we and when we came back in January and February we decided to suspend our spring semester of our small groups in order for us to gather ourselves together to make them more stronger to make them uh, and to, to energize that base right there and be able to go forth we have a bit uh, we have a value here at living waters we have a value here that says this that small groups are a big deal Small groups are a big deal. And we believe here at Living Waters that we want to be a church that does not have small groups. We want to be a church of small groups. And there's a big deal. There's a big difference between that because we make a big deal about them. And we, we encourage every person, regular attenders and owners that live in Waters, to be part of a small group. And so over the next couple of weeks, we're going to share with you why it is our heart's desire that you be a part of a small group. And over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be uh, rolling out the semesters because we have, we're already strategizing. We have some that are going to meet uh, every week between middle of September all the way into the middle of November. We have other small groups that you can be a part of that are going to be meeting every month once a month and so we have various small groups that are going to be taking place on our campus and off our campus we're going to have small groups that are going to take place in Riverdale some that's going to be south of Riverdale some may be east some may be west some may be north over this centralized campus right here listen you can't even talk about church without speaking about community that word uh, the word that's translated uh, is actually mistranslated in the New Testament where it comes to church throughout the New Testament which is that Greek word that is called ekklesia. It is a word that has been mistranslated over the last couple of decades. That word ekklesia is simply a community or gathering of people who were called together for a specific purpose. It's not even a religious Greek term. And everything big that God does he does it through community. And he doesn't just work with individuals. He works within a community, within a family, a people coming together. Listen, I've never heard a story. I never heard a story that there was not one relational component into a person's testimony. I've never heard a story of a believer that did not have one person not invest in their life spiritually. Maybe it was a mother or a father. Maybe it was a spiritual mentor, a pastor, a Sunday school teacher, or a small group leader. That someone took the time to believe in, in someone that they could make it into things of God. While it is beyond our ability here at Living Waters International Church to create relationships, what we want to do is create environments that are conducive to these types of relationships. And what we have to understand, and this is what I want everyone to understand here at Living Waters, is that your church needs you. Your church needs you. You have experiences. You have walked down paths. You have done things in life. You've been through, and I'm talking about good things and bad things, that can help somebody on their journey with Christ. That I believe that every step of every believer has been ordered and prescribed for them. And the reason why God has taken us on various paths in our journey is because He knows that one day we could be in a small group with another individual that needs to hear our story. Believers, we can't afford to be quiet. We can't afford to be silent. Because I believe somebody's tomorrow is determined on your story today. God created us to be relation, relational people. God did not create us to be alone. And from the beginning of time when God created man, he looked at Adam and he said, man cannot be alone. Man cannot be alone. Let me give you an example. Now, I'm a person who it is okay. I used to have a problem in the early years of going to eat by myself. Now as I'm older and I got seven kids 
I love eating by myself. I'll tell you what, I even like to do something. I ain't taking a step further. And Don always says, I don't see how you do it. Not only do, I don't see how you do it, you always love it. I can go to a movie by myself. I don't have a child wanting to swallow my drink. I don't have nobody's hands in my popcorn basket. And I enjoy that. But I will never, ever, ever go to Six Flags by myself. <laughs> it's just not fun. Can you imagine? Because I, I tell you a story. Can you imagine going to Six Flags? Nobody wants to hear how a good time you had by yourself. And I don't know about you, but riding a roller coaster with someone else is more fun than riding it by yourself. Before our family was at large, we went to Six Flags, just the four of us, myself and Josh and, and Jacob and Karen. I had never been to Six Flags since they built Goliath. And I was going to ride Goliath. So I took a count of everybody. Of all you all three right here, who wants to ride Goliath with me? Everybody looked down. Nobody was going to ride it. Nobody wanted to ride a roller coaster. So I was all by myself. That thing click, 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 click all the way out to the top of that hill. It is the largest, longest, scariest roller coaster I have ever ridden in my life. After I got through, I was pumped. I had done it. I did that thing. I rode it. I screamed. I hollered. I yelled my hands up. I waved them in the air whenever we turned curves. We went and all that. And when I got off, I was excited. I was pumped. The drilling was going. And then when I went to Karen and I went to Jacob and Josh, I said, you guys, this was great. You know what? They could care less. <laughs> they didn't care. They didn't care at all. They didn't want to hear the story. And they did not identify with what I went through because they were not there. Then I found my other son who I love much more. <laughs> and his name is Jane. Take a look at this video. The screen machine at Six Flags Ooh. riding right here with Jaden. Jane and I are up. I'm riding the screen machine. Daddy Jane. We're riding on the front of the, of the whole roller coaster. Are you ready? Are you sure you're ready? roller coaster ride and every now and then we're eating dinner and we can play that video and, 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 and watch that video and we laugh and we laugh about it and we reminisce and, and joke about it and, and, and it's like when can we go again and things like that see life is more fun when you do it with someone else the journey that we're on is much more fun whenever we're able to go through life with somebody else Going through life is not always fun when you're by yourself. And this journey that you're going through with Christ is so important about relational communities and relationships that you build. The success that you have as a believer is determined, is determined on the relationships that you build with folks in Christ. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12, that two are better than one. Because they have good return for their work. If one falls down, if one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one, one keep warm alone? Though one can be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. You see, doing life together matters. We can do more with others than we can do by ourselves. And what is important for us to understand is that you need community because it's going to help you become a stronger and more powerful Christian in your life. 
Let me ask you a question. I want you to look at this picture up here. I want you to see if anybody in here knows this guy. If you know, if you know who he is, raise your hand. Anybody? Anybody in this section? Anyone over here? Here? Anybody over here? Nobody. Nobody knows him. Watch this next screen. Do you know this guy that he's standing with? Look at this. Now everybody knows him. Okay. Yet he could not have the golds, the silvers, and the bronze medals over all the Olympics that Michael Phelps have swam without this guy right here. That is his coach. His name is Bob Bowman. Bob started coaching Michael Phelps when he was a teenager. And one time after he was finished and he said that he ran Michael, ran Michael and just ran him down, made him swim back and forth and train him and train him and train him and train him. And he said that he got to the place that after practice that he was splashing girls out of the pool. And he looked at Michael and he said, I don't understand why you're doing that. He said, you should be tired. He said, I have ran you up and down this pool. And he turned to his coach, Bob, and he said, Bob, I never get tired. And that man right there looked at Michael Phelps that day, and he made it his mission to wear him out. <laughs> and he said he would push him, and he would push him, and he would push him, and then he would chastise him in the pool, and chastise him out of the court, and dis out of the pool, and outside of the pool, and then make sure that he was disciplined in life, and push him, push him, and push him, until he can push him, until he couldn't push him anymore. And now, today, 28 Olympic medals later, 28 Olympic medals. He's retiring and he says he owes it all to that guy right there. Because he knew what his weaknesses were. He knew where he could really tone him up. He knew where to push. He knew where to pull back. He knew where he could soften up. He knew where he could be hard at. And he pushed and he pushed and pushed. He disciplined, he disciplined, and he disciplined. And he disciplined him to the point where he won in the Olympics over and over and over again. And if I heard one phrase and one phrase out of all beside Hussein Bolt, it's this, that he is one of the greatest Olympics, Olympians ever. But Michael Phelps will tell you he couldn't do it without his coach Bob. I knew I would be talking about Michael Phelps today. And so even when he was swimming, I would see Bob in the background. Bob standing there, right by his side while he was there. You see, we in small groups and, in, and, 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 and as, as we're coming together in our groups and building relationship, we have to un understand the verse where it says, just like as iron sharpens iron, so no one man sharpens another. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Can I tell you, I know in our small group it's not always easy. Because sometimes in our small groups we ask hard questions. But we're better for it. We can push sometimes. Celebrate sometimes. Cry one week. Laugh the next. But when we get together, we sharpen each other. When something happens and one falls, we're there for one another. When one is going through something, we're there for one another. Because we sharpen one another. To keep accountability in your life, you need someone there to be there to discipline you. Learn to endure the discipline because discipline is what makes extraordinary disciples of Christ. It's the discipline. The discipline that we need. I said, you need a community because in your community, there's going to be someone there in your community that's going to cheer you on. And someone's going to be there that's going to be the cheerleaders in your life. One of my favorite Olympians that I enjoy is not even American. He's Britain. And I like the relationship that he has. His name is Mofara. Just last night, he won another goal in long distance running. That guy right there, number 3250, this is a picture from the London Olympics is not only his friend, but his running partner, his mentor, his, 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 his right-hand man named Galen Rupp, who, try, who trains with him from the United States. When the most historic Olympic events took place uh, in London four years ago, 
as Galen was running against his good friend Mofara. Mofara Mof, uh, was ahead. Galen came in second. In these Olympics, he didn't even place. But in London, he was right behind Mofara. And when Mofara ran across the finish line and he got the gold medal, you know who was more excited about that gold medal than Mofara? Was his best friend, Galen Robb. Look it up on YouTube. Galen was so excited. They had trained together. They had pushed each other. They were there for each other. But Galen at that race, when his friend went across the line, he became his best cheerleader. And you would have thought that Galen won the gold. But he had won the gold. Because he was the best cheerleader for his friend. And see, when we go through life, we need to learn to be cheerleaders in other people's life. I believe how you advance on the job is how well you cheer your co-workers on. I didn't get a lot of amens on that one. <laughs> See, in the office place and families at family rooms, we have this terrible thing where we're just bringing people down. But God has told us that we need to be cheerleaders in other people's lives. He told us in 1 Thessalonians 5.11, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. He told us in Hebrews 3.13, be encouraged. Encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. He said in Proverbs 16.24, pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. He said in Ephesians 4.29, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. Say right there. I'm going to keep on going, but I'm going to repeat that verse one more time. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. So we got we to gotta learn how to be cheerleaders in people's lives. We got to learn how to be there to encourage one another. Do those attaboys. You want to make it. You're going to get through this. You're going to be okay. Because every one of us have gone through situations where we thought the end of our world and existence was about to end. how we need somebody to be able to reach out to us and how we need a group of people that we can rely on that we can reach at and say hey I need your help I'm going through so much I can't take anymore Thursday I, I called a regular tender here at Living Waters just to see how she was doing the phone call went like this. And some of you are like this when I call you too. She said, hello. And I said, is so-and-so there? She said, who is this? <laughs> I said, this is Jason Rowland from Living Waters International. She said, hey! <laughs> she said, Pastor, I'm clear across, across the country. She said, I'm sitting here. We're waiting for my mother to have an open heart surgery. My uncle seems to have been given up, has given up on continuing on his uh, efforts to get better, like giving up on life. I have a flight that's leaving Sunday and they, they keep postponing the operation and I'm trying to make a decision about when to come back. And also I've got things back home that I gotta take care of. I said, Pastor, you called at the right time. And it was just so, God, to allow me to pick up the phone. In fact, I, I, I'm going to go a step further. When I came back from vacation, I wrote her name on, her, on my whiteboard in my office, and it was there for three weeks, and I still didn't call her. Now that I know, the reason why I couldn't or didn't call her, because God knew the right time he needed me to pick up the phone at the right moment when she was at her wit's end, clear across the country, and needed her pastor just to reach out, pray with her over the phone, and just pray that and, and, and ask God to intervene in this situation. 
Beloved, we need to be there for one another. We need to be there for one another. And you know what? Her being clear across the country, she felt alone. And you need your community to protect you from the enemy. Yeah. You need a small crew that is going to protect you from the enemy. The Bible says in John 10.10 10, that the thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. First Peter said this in 5.8. He says, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion for someone to devour. The enemy's not a lion, but he likes to growl like he's one. And if he can get you off by yourself, he's got you. I can test that personally. I mean, I know how to throw a pity party. And my pity parties are by myself with my own confetti and my own music. And I throw it in the air and I step up underneath it too. So I throw confetti in there. And, and I tell you, and then those times I have to stop myself to say, whoa, 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 you need to reach out to somebody. Sometimes it's just I need my wife to come home. And then sometimes Karen comes home and I'll say, Karen, let me just tell you what's going on. I remember one Sunday afternoon, I left here from church and Carol was down in the kitchen and I was upstairs in the bedroom. And I mean, the enemy, it was like he was sitting there and he was telling me and telling me and telling me all these lies because I don't know if you know about it, but the only language he knows how to speak really well are lies. That's what the Bible says. And I had to leave the bedroom. I came downstairs. I sat while Carol was in the kitchen and I just said, let me tell you what's going on. You wouldn't believe since I got home how the enemy was just da 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 One of the things that America, and I'm just going to say this right, one of the things that, that has gone on on social media throughout America and the world is the, the pictures that they took of Hussein Bolt during the, uh, the, the heat uh, that they went through to qualify, the qualifying heat. If you might have seen it online where he's turning to the side, he's laughing, he's smiling. And so people have been making memes out of it, you know, putting words on pictures and, and saying things like that. And so I saw one the other day where he was running, and it said, this is like, and it was on a, on a, on a humorous church thing on Instagram where they do things like this. Is, this is like folks in church running from the devil. <laughs> and I saw it, and I said, whoa, whoa, that ain't me. Because I don't run from no devil. The devil runs from me. Amen. When I get up in the morning... He says, oh, hell no, he's on. <laughs> and that's what he says about you, my, my beloved. He wants to, when you get something, you need to make him scared that he runs from you. He is not a lion. He is like a lion. But the lion of the tribe of Judah reigns inside of you. In him we live and we move and we have our feet. And when we get up, the devil freaks out because you got up again and you started breathing. And that means life is in you. And it's not only your life, but the life of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And he knows that when you step up out of your house, you are an ambassador not for his kingdom, but for God's kingdom. And you're going forth that way. But sometimes we get alone. Sometimes we get down and it feels like we got to run. And the enemy wants to make us feel like we're running. But beloved, we got to be there for one another. We got to be that community of believers. We got to be the church that when one is alone, we're reaching out. Yeah. When one is alone, we're picking up the phone. When one is alone, we're sending a message through Facebook or, or Instagram or social media. Someone's there. I never forget the time. I was so proud of living waters through one of the darkest days of our days here at Living Waters International Church. And we as a church family lost someone that we loved so much. He was a phenomenal leader here. It was Teresa's husband, Jimmy. Served on our stewardship team. Served as a leader here. And it, it, it was Jeff's father, Teresa's husband. And we as a church, and myself and Karen, we were always wanting to be there. I don't know if you remember, Teresa, we went out to lunch and, and Teresa said to me, she said, 
you know, thank, thanked us for being there during that darkest time. And, I'll, and I've said this before, that when, when people go through things like that in their life, I feel the most unqualified as a pastor. But during that time, I know for me personally, I went through my own grief of losing him. There were times that we as a church encouraged one another. He placed, he, he was, our, he was our, our Santa Claus there and he passed away two months before Christmas and that Christmas we didn't have a Santa Claus. If you were here, you remember it was a pretty dreary Christmas, wasn't it? Gail? That was what we're for. That when people go through, they don't go through it alone. We're right there beside them when they're sick. We're right there beside them when they're going through tough times. We're right there beside them to push the tissue box over to them when they're weeping. And God has called us to weep with those who, to weep and rejoice with those who are rejoicing. And we cannot afford to let one of our own in the church go up through life by themselves. Yeah. And we have to be there one for another. Right. One for another. So what is the big deal? Community. Because without community, you will die as a believer. Yeah. We got technology that we're taking advantage of. The church is taking advantage of. We're doing live streaming and and, and putting stuff on YouTube, we're about to reach 200 videos on our YouTube channel. But I want to tell you that being and watching a YouTube channel, living in waters is nothing like rubbing shoulders with one of our brothers and sisters here everywhere, every Sunday worshiping. Amen. Social media, live videos, YouTube will never take the place of what being and assembling ourselves together, of physically being together, means to one to another. But as we come together on Sunday, it will never do what a small group would do in your life. Like a small group has done in my life and many of those who attend small groups. Because when you get in smaller groups, you grow bigger. And I know that sounds crazy. But as you're getting into connection groups and getting into there and sharpening one another, sometimes being vulnerable, sometimes holding everything back and not wanting to share just being in the presence to realize I'm not doing life alone. I'm not doing this by myself. You've been through this too. You've been through this journey too. And all of a sudden, I've gone through into small groups that I have been a part of with my head down, but come out like a lion, empowered, stronger, ready to tackle the world. And sometimes it's not been the prayers of the saints. Sometimes it's not even been a word that was said. But it's that, that somebody knows my story. And they were there for me just to listen. So as the next couple of weeks, we're going to be unveiling more and more information as, we, as we're putting and assembling things all together. On September the 11th, what I told was going to take place is that we're going to set up our lobby and our small groups are going to be promoting themselves. We're going to promote them in your connection packs. We're going to promote them on the screen. We want you to be part of a small group this semester. We're talking about many ideas. If I share them, I'm, I'm scared I will share things that won't come to pass. But there's going to be something for everybody. And we're trying to make sure that small groups have, hit every schedule you have. You work third shift, second shift, first shift. If you live here in Riverdale or you live in Henry County, Fulton County, DeKalb County, we're trying to figure out what we can do so that everybody can be a part. Because we believe the big deal needs to be that you're part of a small group. And I will even take it a step further. That if you can't make it to church on Sunday, you better make it to a small group. Because I'm telling you, small groups empower the believer to tackle the world. And you will go farther and you will go stronger if you are part of a connection group. Because iron sharpens iron. So a man sharpens into one another. Let us pray. God, I thank you. Host, come on.